We've been looking at the uh, topic of uh, did you know? We first asked Mary, did you know? And then uh, we asked Joseph, did you know? Last night we asked uh, shepherds, did you know? And this morning uh, the question is, world, did you know? And uh, as I asked that question, I say, world, did you know that some people sincerely look for Jesus? They do. They sincerely look for Jesus. But they just don't know where to find him. And I think that's what we have here with the, the Magi. As it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. The question is, who is the Magi? Some translations have wise men. When we sing, we three kings of Orient are, we're assuming that they were kings. So who are these guys called the Magi? Well, we really can't definitively say who they are. But when uh, you uh, follow doing Bible study, Scripture comparing Scripture, you'll find that the Magi are mentioned in the Old Testament. They're found in the book of Daniel like three different times. Remember, Daniel was just a young man when Nebuchadnezzar came and carried away all the Jewish young fellows from uh, Jerusalem back to Babylon, especially if they were royalty, they were educated, they were handsome and strong, their qualifications. He took them and put them in his own school. He did this from all over the world. Every place he conquered, he took the very best, the young men. Daniel was just a teenager. He's lumped in with a bunch of people. Now, now he would have been just a good old Jewish boy, but he's there with these pagan guys. Some of them are astrologers, astronomers. Some of them are magicians. And you find those terms used in the book of Daniel with the, the guys he's thrown in with. And uh, it's very interesting because the word that is translated magician, and you can almost hear the word magi in there, right? Magician, <laughs> magician. You can see it right in there. Uh, most translations put it as soothsayers or astrologers or astronomers, something like that. That is the word magi. It's magi. It's in the Old Testament. Now, I have my own theory about this. It's, uh, uh, now, this is not the gospel. This is not the Bible. This is my theory how this all worked. Daniel was carried into captivity. He purposed in his heart that he would not sin against God by participating in the, the king's food. And, and so he said, I want to be a vegetarian. I'm not going to eat that stuff because it, it, it's not kosher. I will defile me before my God. And, and so he took a stand for God. And everybody thought, oh boy, is he in big trouble? But God blessed him. God blessed him. Uh, later when uh, he was told not to pray and he, he prayed anyway and they threw him in the lion's den and you know what happened God sent his angel stop the lion's mouth from devouring guess what every time he goes back and he's hanging out with these magi and they start asking him who is your God who is this Jehovah and he starts talking about Jehovah God Daniel in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel is confessing his sins, and God sends an angel to him, said, hey, I would have gotten here sooner, but uh, I, I was opposed. And he said, listen, 70 weeks are determined upon your people. Now, weeks is really, a, we use week always of days. It's kind of like the word dozen. It just, dozen means a 12 of something. It could be a dozen eggs. It could be a dozen of just about anything. A week, when it was originally written, could be seven of anything. And there it's seven years, 70 years of seven years, 490 years will be determined upon your people until the Messiah, the Messiah will be cut off, violently cut off, not for his sin, the text says, but for the sin of his people. He gives a starting point, and all you got to do from that starting point on the Jewish calendar is count down 490 years. I'm not going to take you through all the mathematics of that. It's a little complicated because they went by a Jewish calendar, not our calendar, which was a 360-day year, now a 365-day year. And when you do all the calculations, you put it back into us, <clears throat> he's predicting right down to the, the day, some scholars and researchers say, to the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the donkey, presenting himself as king on Palm Sunday. 
Knowing that, any Bible scholar should be able to back it up a few years and say he's got to be born within this period. They should have known all that. Well, at least the Magi, the Magi had heard this stuff possibly from Daniel. And so they are waiting and counting down and figuring because of what this great prophet of God had said. Could it be? Could it be? Anyway, the Magi, these people who, over the, the centuries that had followed from Daniel, they become students of what Daniel had said. Maybe Daniel had also said something like, you know, in the book of Numbers, it says, a star will arise out of Jacob, and he will be the ruler of my people. And so they might have taken that literally and looking for a star. Well, God miraculously gave a star. We know that from this passage. And these magi were following the star and they came to Jerusalem and they asked this provocative question. Where is he? The one who has been born king of the Jews. We we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. You say, how could this be a provocative question? Where is he the born king of the Jews? Well, it's kind of provocative because the king at the time in Jerusalem is Herod the Great. Now, Herod the Great, according to one of the commentators I read, a a great American uh, New Testament scholar says he's Herod the Great pervert. The man was demented. He was evil. In fact, Josephus, the historian, says that he wasn't even Jewish. He was an Idumean by birth, but he claimed to be Jewish, and so he is a fake king of the Jews, not the real king. They said, where is he that we have? So the one who has been born king of the Jews. So the king would have been surely threatened Because he's a usurper king and not the real king. Some seek, uh, superficially, look for Jesus. Whereas the wise men were truly seeking to find Jesus, some superficially look for Jesus so that they can try to manipulate him. They can try to manipulate him. Here's what I mean. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Of course he's disturbed. This is a threat to his reign. And all Jerusalem with him. I often wondered, why was all Jerusalem with him upset? That's because they knew how bad this king was and what he might do. He just superficially, though, makes an inquiry for Jesus. He's not really seeking Jesus to worship Jesus, When he had called together the people's, notice that, the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. He doesn't even consider them his priests, nor his lawyers, because he is a usurper. He asked them where the king was to be born. I find this extremely interesting because one of the qualifications for a king who is a Jewish king was that he was required to write the entire book of the law of Moses out. If he had done that, he would have known himself what the law said and where he was, uh, where he was supposed to come from. He would have known this, but he did not. He is a super. You see, he's superficial about everything. And, and all he wants to know is where Jesus is. The, well, he doesn't know him as Jesus yet. But he wants to find this Christ child, this, this Messiah, this King of the Jews, so he can manipulate and strategize, ultimately, to kill him. So some scripturally look for Jesus. Why would they look scripturally for Jesus? So that they can authoritatively know him where they can they could know for certainty. And so the, the chief priests and the scribes and, and, and the lawyers, they do a search and they say, well, it's in Bethlehem in Judea, they reply. For this is what the prophet has written. The Bible is our authoritative guide for our faith and practice. It was then, it is now. He says, but you, Bethlehem, 
in the land of Judah are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Out of you will come a ruler. It was right there, written in the scripture all the time, where he would be born. That's why last night when we were going over uh, the Luke account where uh, they had to travel 90 miles. They had to travel from Nazareth down to Bethlehem because God put this whim in Caesar's head that there should be a census taken of all the land. And in order to register for the census, you had to go back to the town in which you were born. That forced Mary and Joseph, uh, who were of the house and lineage of David in Bethlehem, to make a 90-mile trek so that she would have her child born in Bethlehem to fulfill Scripture. And God put it in Caesar's head. <laughs> you see, God is in control of everything. Even the thoughts of those who are wicked. He works everything together for good. And out of Bethlehem comes a ruler and he will be the shepherd of my people. Some, though, are very slyly looking for Jesus. Slyly looking for Jesus. To deceive you about him. Don't think it's unusual that uh, people would pretend to be something they are not to get the upper hand. Years ago, I had a man come into my church claiming to be a Christian. And uh, then he was actually... Uh, warming up to people. He was an investor. He told people he'd do some investment for them. And rather than put it in the investments in which they said, he put it in something else. And what he had was a scam going on. <laughs> he was ripping off the people. But he knew, he knew that the Bible said Christians are not supposed to sue Christians. And so he was going to try to get away with this. In fact, he had in a couple churches before. Except we follow the biblical principle that you go to the person and you confront him. That person then uh, denied it, that, that he was doing that, took a second person with him, confronted him again. He would not repent nor change his way. Then they told it to the whole church. The whole church then were to treat him as an unbeliever. He said, now they treat him as an unbeliever, sue him. <laughs> Sued him, won the case. The guy actually did time eventually. You see, there are those who slyly, they're not on the up and up, to deceive you. Then Herod called the Magi in secretly. And he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. What's he need to know that for? He knows that this is a threat to his kingdom and to his heirs. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search. I think I got that underlined. Go and make a careful search. As soon as you find him, report it to me so I too may go and worship him. Oh, he is so sly. You know, sometimes we Christians are so doggone gullible. Too gullible. Can I tell you one that's a, we're, we're, we're gullible, hook, line, and sinker? Islam is a, is a peaceful religion. We are way too gullible on that. Way too gullible. Way too gullible. They, here, Herod, who is a po he's not even the Jewish king, but he's ruling over them, sees a threat. He is so sly and so deceptive. But some are steadfastly looking for Jesus. Uh, the, the Magi don't give up. They're not going to give up until they find him. They are in a question, no matter what the cost, they're going to find King Jesus. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now, some people try to find some real star in the sky, and they try to wind the universe backwards to the place in time where there's a star that appeared on that Christmas. The only difficulty I have with all of that is it led them. That's what the text says. It actually led them. It was a moving star. Okay, I've seen shooting stars, and I've seen all of that. But then it stopped. Boom. 
Now, I don't know. These are pretty wise guys. They must have triangulated off of that star where it stopped. And, and they went to the very place underneath it. And guess what? They didn't find a stable. You're going to find out. They found a house. So this, is not, this did not happen on Christmas Day. I know all us artists paint the picture with Jesus, you know, in the manger, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds are there, the wise men are there. I mean, it's because we tried to get the whole story in one picture. But time doesn't operate that way. You don't get it all in one. Obviously, they're still in Bethlehem. And uh, uh, he must be renting a house by now. And so it stops over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They knew that they hit it. This is it. This is it. This is where we want to be. And on coming into the house, they saw the child. They found him. You know, in the Old Testament, he says, uh, God says, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you seek me with all your heart. They saw the child with the mother of Mary and they bowed down and they worshipped him and they opened up their gifts, it says, and they presented to him, they presented gifts. Now, you know, in the passage, it never tells us that there were three magi. Some believe there were at least a dozen, some Christian traditions. And then there was the entourage with them, okay, because they were coming to a king, all right? And they present gold. They, they print, pre, present this incense, frankincense, and myrrh. They, they present these things, which would have been gifts that you would have given to a king in the day. They present them to baby Jesus. I'm not so sure they were looking for a baby. They were just looking for the one who was born a king, not a hostile takeover king. I think they must have been really surprised that they got all these lavish gifts for an infant baby, baby Jesus. It says, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. You know, some schemingly look for Jesus. They got, they got schemes, and that's exactly what we find. Why? So they can destroy him. And that's what the, the rest of this text is going to talk about. It says, when they had gone, the Magi had left and gone off the scene. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. He'd done this once before. An angel appears to him again in a dream. And he says, get up. He says, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, Herod is going to search for the child. He's getting a warning. And the intention is, to kill him. To kill him. Not everyone is seeking Jesus to embrace him. Not everyone is seeking Christians to embrace them. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you. It should not shock us when we see ISIS beheading Christians, they hate us, just like Herod hated the Christ child. They hate us for being followers of him. As Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you also. So having been warned by that dream, he didn't waste any time. He, as soon as he woke up, he got up and he took the child, his mother, and during the night, he said, listen, I'm not waiting till morning the angel warned me, I'm out of here, and he left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Quote from the Old Testament. All of this is fulfilling. You know, there are more, so many prophecies, there's hundreds of prophecies about the coming of our Savior. And here's just one more. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders, kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity 
who were two years old and under, in according to the time which he had learned from the Magi when they started their quest. He figured, oh, by now it's been two years. We're going to wipe out every male in Bethlehem. That way I will have gotten rid of, I will have gotten rid of the threat to my throne. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Some schemingly look for Jesus so they can destroy him. You know, some stop looking for Jesus and they never find him. They never find him. After Herod died, you see, when you die, it's too late. He never did find Jesus, and that's a good thing, because he was out to destroy him. Other people never find him, and that is a bad thing, because he came into the world to save us. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said to, to Joseph, Get up! Take the child and the mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. You see, when you're dead, you can't find them anymore. You only have this life to find Jesus. I have noticed for those uh, in in this life, uh, you know, they seek him but often don't find him. And in that process of seeking, they're, they're seeking for something they don't know what they're looking for. As kids, we were seeking Christmas because it gave us a lot of toys and pleasure. That filled that emptiness in our heart, and pretty soon we got past that. The toys got old. It wasn't as exhilarating as the first day, as like later when you're a teenager, you go to the the amusement park and you ride the roller coaster. The first time, it's so exhilarating. The tenth time, you say, well, is that all there is? When you get a little older, you know, you're, you're you're, you're a... a young parent and you've got a child and you live for that child and and pretty soon you're finding that uh, that doesn't fill that need deep down inside. You're seeking for something that give purpose and direction to your life and and then you hit the midlife, you know, you've already been through some success at work, you found your career, you got your family and all that and you hit midlife and you say, is that all there is? There must be something more. And then we move on to retirement. Well, now is the time. I don't have to work. I've got this. I'm going to just, I'm going to do whatever I want. And you wind up saying, is that all there is? Isn't there something more? Always seeking, never finding. Because in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says, God put eternity in our hearts. The hole there is so big, no matter what you put in it, when you're done, you say, is that all there is? I'm going to tell you what. Our president-elect, Trump, had everything monetarily. It wasn't enough. Now he's got the presidency. I'll let you in on a little secret. It's not going to be enough. Nothing can fill that hole except eternity. And Jesus Christ is the eternal God, whom in Ephesians it says, He dwells in our hearts by faith. Only Jesus can fill up what is lacking deep inside. Only Jesus, only Jesus. They died never finding him. And so it says, uh, Joseph got up. He took the child and his mother and he went to the land of Israel. When he arrives in the land of Israel, he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod. Oh man. Suppose he's passed on that anger and bitterness towards the child. So he decides that he's afraid to go there. And so he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And in particular, he went and lived in the town of Nazareth, where the whole journey began when that angel appeared, Gabriel, to Mary, and told her she was so blessed, appeared to Joseph in a dream. And then um, made his journey later to Bethlehem, down to Egypt. Now he's back to Nazareth. Why Nazareth? No one would have looked for a king in Nazareth. Nazareth was the redneck section of Palestine or the Holy Land of Israel. No one would look for the king there. 
And so it was, he, he will be called, it was also fulfilled prophetic, prophetic word that he will be called a Nazarene, one who came from Nazareth. For some, the sad point of this whole story is this. They knew their king had come. I'm talking about those scribes and the priests and all the people who had gone to the synagogue, the temple, and they'd learned under them, and, and they knew that a Messiah was come. It was, it was in the book. They knew so because they had an authoritative record telling it was going to happen. They knew the Holy Scriptures. They knew that also that a Palm Sunday was coming where Jesus at one day would actually present himself as king at least in 30 years, just about 30 years. That prophecy of Daniel would be fulfilled. They knew it all, but they did not believe it. Isn't that amazing? In the book of Romans, it says you have to believe, you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Someone has said people miss heaven by 12 inches. The distance between their head and their heart. They know it here, but they don't believe it here. If you believe it here, you commit your whole life to him. If you know it here, you say, that's pretty good stuff. Wow, amazing. And that's spectacular. But when you know it here, you love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's when you really believe. They knew it here, not here. But watch what the next verse I have here. It's my closing verse. For some, it was the other. For others, the best part of the story is this. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. They, they should have known. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. He came to the Jewish people as their king, as their Messiah. They rejected him. We will not have this man to rule over us. Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Yet to all who receive him. Now he wants to tell you how you receive him. That's the next part of the verse. To those who believe in their heart, in his name. The Semitic concept of the name means more than just a title. It's who you are and what you do. When you really believe he is the Son of God and that he went to the cross and he died on the cross for your sins, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. That's how we're saved. We believe. That's what Christmas is about. The Son of God who's come into the world. You see, wise men still seek him. And wise men still find him. They receive him into their hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for the gospel message in this Advent season. Lord, I pray that everyone here is those who seek him and seek him with all their heart. Seek till they find. And when they find him, find that he is a treasure above all else. And while there are those who are superficially seeking him, slyly seeking him, those who are wanting to destroy him, we are those who are willing to give our lives for him because he gave his life for us. Lord, in a few moments we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper where we recognize that he came into the world to purchase our salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking our place. It's in your name we pray. Amen.